Good. So, um, yeah. Welcome everybody to um, this PhD defense by Ali Adjulo. Yes. And um, my name is Hans Jørgen Andersen. I'm the moderator of this defense. And I will start with introducing the um, assessment panel where we are very pleased to have some, some really good researchers who found on time for this. We are very, very much appreciated. From the uh, University of South California, we have Professor Skip Riso, Riso, who's an expert and been working for many years with virtual reality system, talking in clinical assessment, treatment, and re re rehabilitation. Uh, Skip has got a prize, 2010, from the American Psychology Association for his work on PT, PTSD. Uh, Skip had also in recent years worked with autism spectrum disorder. And as I said, has been a pioneer within uh, virtual reality, within health science and medicine. And uh, we're really pleased that you are part of this board assessment panel. Then from Denmark, we have uh, Professor Marete Nordtoff from Copenhagen University was also an expert in epidemiology, societal behavior, psychopathology, and early intervention in psychology. Uh, Mireille won a prize in 2012 for her global excellence in health in Denmark. And uh, again, we're also really pleased that you have found time to be in the assessment panel. From our own department, George Trifolitis have been is our internal member of the assessment panel, and uh, the defense, which is online, and this is the first time I moderate an online defense. So uh, hopefully everything turns out well. We have we are well prepared. But we do it in the same manner as it was in uh, the physical world, uh, where Ali will do his uh, presentation for about 45 to 50 minutes. Then we will uh, have a break for about 10 minutes. And uh, if you, from the audience, if there's anybody who wants to ask Ali a question, then you have to contact me in the break. After the break, there will be questions for at most two hours by the panel, but we will return to, to that after the break. First, I will give the, the word to Ali now, and really looking forward to his presentation. So uh, please, Ali, the word is yours. Thank you so much, Ansia, uh, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I will just get right down to it because time. Uh, so. I started doing this project investigating how virtual reality can be used to teach social and daily living skills to children and adolescents diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder three years ago. And uh, my background is uh, I'm a meteorologist, so I work within the field of human computer interaction. Uh, I, am a I know how to develop interactive virtual environments. I know Unity. I, I, I mean, within UX usability and all kind of these this, this fields. So my knowledge about autism was not big, but when working with this topic, you need an interdisciplinary team. That's why I've been so lucky to work with teachers, uh, such as these guys uh, from uh, other municipality and other municipalities who have uh, helped me with the knowledge I needed, because these guys work with children, adolescents, and adolescents with autism on a daily basis, they know. What's, what their requirements, what their needs, what their desires are. I've been also been working with some psychologists, uh, such as uh, this guy, Sean, uh, who is uh, one of the, who's worked with uh, anxiety disorders, kids with anxiety disorders and uh, also autism. Uh, and he's been giving me lots of interesting feedback and awesome feedback that I've used in my work. And of course, I've been studying publication, uh, I mean, from uh, you guys and uh, everything I could get my hands on to understand autism to understand how we can use virtual reality to help this target group, because again, this requires an interdisciplinary team. I come with a computer science background, but I need the psychologists, I need the teachers. And I, of course, I need the knowledge that's previously been there. 
What I learned is that autism spectrum is a broad spectrum of neurodevelopmental disorder. That around one side of the spectrum, you can have individuals on the low functioning part who will have a hard time even formulating simple sentences. These guys will have a hard time understanding facial expression uh, and so on. Uh, they will have a hard time keeping eye contact. They will have severe learning disabilities. They will have, and so on. On the other, and also low IQ, that's the low functioning part of it. On the other side of the spectrum, we can have uh, individuals uh, on the high functioning side of it who uh, might have nice jobs uh, working as programmers, professors, whatever, but uh, due to the so lack of social skills, they might even have, a, have, a, had, have had a hard time getting that job to begin with. Maybe a hard time getting job interviewed because of lack of social skills, or even when they get the job, when they go to the cafeteria, oh my God, there are all these people standing all over the cafeteria. Where should I stand in line? How should I greet this uh, person selling me the items and so on? You know, all these social deficits are still there despite the higher IQ and maybe some of them are even very geniuses, but the social skill deficits are there. Uh, so I learned that the lack of communication skills, so the whole facial expression and stuff like that, because I'm not autistic, I can look at you guys and have an idea. Now I see Mairead is smiling a little bit and I, and I can guess that maybe she's enjoying this because I can read facial expressions. Uh, maybe, uh, um, I, 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 maybe I can think, okay, maybe they are thinking about whatever's gonna happen after this event. But I'm not autistic, so I, 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 I have an idea. But if I was autistic, I would look at you guys and start panicking. What's going on? What are they thinking? Are they judging me? It would even be worse if I wasn't talking to a web camera and it was in front of you guys. Uh, but this lack of communication skills and then lack of I mean, understanding of social, uh, social skills. So such as what are the unwritten rules? Am I allowed to speak? How do I ask somebody if that person wanna play? How do I ask a peer if he wants to play in the playground and so on. And then finally, lack of imagination. I learned that that's a thing about autism is that they have a hard time understanding verbal instructions. They need to see it, they need to try it, they need to do it. Uh, so I learned that if I had a child uh, uh, who was autistic uh, and I would tell him tomorrow, dear child, when you go to school, you should watch out for the cars, you should find the cross section, you should look to your left, look to your right. But due to his autism, he might have problem imagining my verbal instructions. You will need to see it and try it. And that's why most of the traditional methods out there that have tried to teach social and daily living skills to this target group, they have relied on visual information. And these are methods such as social stories. The old method, and it worked, the studies out there that showed this method works, is a teacher, a therapist, or whoever sits down with the child and they go through some social stories where they use uh, the visuals as, as, a, as, as the support for what they're, they're communicating to the child. So for instance, when I get angry, sometimes I hit mommy. So what, what does it mean when I get angry? And there's a picture of an angry kid and so on. So they can rely on the visuals and it works. But then the problem is that let's say you're autistic, you're uncomfortable around people, it's still a person communicating the social story to you. And you might feel uncomfortable around that person. Also sometimes ADHD is quite common among autistic individuals. So you get easily distracted by everything else that's going on. You are not immersed into the social story. You're just having a piece of paper in a real world classroom. Everything else is whatever, all the distraction can be there. Another method that shows to work is the method called video modeling, which is a, a method where you show a video of the desired behavior to the child. And then after some repetition of watching this video, the child learns how to do the performance uh, like correctly, like turn taking. This is a video to teach the child child to take turns. Turn. Thank you, it's your turn. Yeah, it's your turn. Oh, it's my turn. Watch. As so, and, and this also works, but again, video modeling, maybe you get distracted, you have a limited number of, it's not, it's not interactive. You cannot try it out yourself. You can just watch somebody, it's more passive and so on. There's another method, which is quite interactive. It's not very passive. And you are in the context of this desire, this, that's the place where you have to perform the desired skills. And it's called peer-mediated interventions. And here we have the, the child with a, 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 a autism who can learn from a typically developed child how to play in a playroom at the school. So the typically developed child who doesn't have any diagnosis is uh, trained by a teacher to how to help this guy play with the others. And then it's that they're in the right environment, they're in the playground. And this child can... Uh... Oh, 
auch sehr. Also she, the teacher is guiding her and she's trying to help the kid do the right thing. And one thing, and this is this is beautiful. It's in the right context of where the skill should be, uh, con uh, perform. The problem is that this girl is hard to train her. Also, you, it's hard to understand, get inform data on whether she did it in the right way or the wrong way, for instance. But of course, there are some deficits with this method as well. But all of these methods, they have one thing in common, and that is they rely on visual audio information. They are multi-sensory experiences. They visual, social stories have the visual, and the other one had the visual, and so on. The peer methods are training, you are in the environment, uh, so they are multi-sensory experience. Oh, well, I mean, that's what we can do with virtual reality. Uh, we can place the users inside relevant virtual environments, interactive virtual environments, within which we can, they can rehearse the desired skills. This is actually uh, one of the test participants I was so lucky to conduct the study on at the Roller Municipality. And one day he was wearing this uh, hoodie, adolescent under construction at the school when I was doing a test. And that was a like, perfect name for my PhD thesis. So that's how it ended up being named that. But this guy, he's in the school physically right now. But I could, using a VR intervention, place him on the street where he could learn how to cross the street safely. I can place him in the supermarket where he can learn how to shop. I can place him in the park where he can play, play, practice in a safe environment how to approach other kids, how to play with them, and so on. So that's what I set out to do with this uh, project. And to begin with, I start to look at all the studies I could find that use the terms virtual reality and children. And to my knowledge, I, I mean, I found a lot that used the term virtual reality and autism, a lot, lot. And uh, already back in 1996, uh, I found a study done by Strickland et al., a very pioneering study where two kids, they uh, were trained to wear a head-mounted display. Uh, and then they were supposed to, uh, they were asked, she wanted, they wanted to investigate whether they would accept wearing the head-mounted display and also if they could perform some simple tasks while wearing this. And then it turned out they were capable of, uh, they were placed in a scene with some cars and a street. And then they, they were asked to just follow the cars and say out the color of the cars. That's it. And they accepted it and they performed the task. The parents of one of the kids before the study, in order to prepare the kid for that, she was uh, giving the kid a lot of helmets, like riding helmets, bicycle helmets. So she, she would get used to helmets before the study. But that, that, that I found this using head-mounted display. Then another study in 2013, so there's a huge gap. In the 90s, uh, unfortunately, I, I, to my knowledge, again, I, to my knowledge, I, I couldn't find anything else that used a head-mounted display. I found a lot of studies using screens, joystick, caves even, but this one used a head-mounted display to assess uh, uh, autistic children's uh, attention towards ritual avatars compared to typical developed children. So it was more assessment, which is a very nice thing to use VR for, like uh, I, the study you did on uh, ADHD and how that can be, uh, we can assess ADHD in children uh, with the classroom experience. And then there were, I found in total up to 2017, where I started this PhD, a total of five papers that use head-mounted displays. And only the study uh, of uh, these guys that used a Oculus Rift SDK1. But again, that's only to my knowledge. I just started to look and dig in. It's not a systematic review. I just wanted to, you know, before starting, what else has been done out there? And this is uh, done on the second live uh, using a plugin with, uh, with Oculus SDK1. But because and, and it, it, this tells me that everybody wanted to do VR, but technology was not ready. The technology in the 90s, maybe early to, uh, 2000s, it was not ready to be used for this kind of stuff back then. But it is now, when I started this PhD, that technology is there. We have the required head-mounted displays. We have the required, uh, I mean, all the development tools such as the Unreal Engine, the Unity Engine, everything is there for us to create awesome interventions. So the, uh, this uh, nuclear winter of VR is done soon. I mean, basically it is. So I started to look into the matter. Now we know that we can, so what should we look at within autism? So I look at what social and daily living skills, that was, these are my research questions. What social and daily living skills make sense to train using head-mounted display-based VR interventions? Because I want to focus on head-mounted display-based VR interventions. How can six degree of freedom VR be used to teach daily and living skills to these guys? Six degree of freedom is something that is there. We had the like the Samsung Gear VR back in the days, three degrees of freedom. You didn't have the super nice interaction, interactivity powers you have now. You couldn't move around on all the six uh, axes. You could only do PTO role. 
and X, Y, Z was not possible. Now uh, with, with this guy here, I can take it on and I can start walking around my room and I can even use my hands to grab objects and do all kinds of stuff. So how can we use that for this specific target group? And then finally, what should the role of the teachers, clinicians or professionals that work with this target group be when Use, when developing this kind of application? What should they do? I mean, is it there to replace them or what? I, I, then I set out to investigate that and that investigation turned out to become this PhD thesis, including these 13 papers from A to M. And during these uh, interventions and these papers, they describe virtual interventions that are published and do studies on, a, uh, for instance, a virtual supermarket to practice shopping, a virtual uh, money training to practice uh, using real Danish money to pay for your items, a multi-user supermarket where the teacher could be co-present with the students in the same virtual environment, all wearing head-mounted displays. Streets, street crossing a virtual intervention was developed uh, and published. Uh, Danish, I look into uh, public transportation in Denmark. How can we use 360 video to prepare some of these kids to take the public transportation? Clean the kitchen in VR. That's something some of the teachers from all municipality told me that they really they could read something that could help them teach the students to clean up after themselves in the kitchen. And I have had several girlfriends who may believe the same about me. Uh, exposure therapy in VR. S exposure therapy is what it all started. Uh, so I decided, okay, let's, let's try to look into that as well. Multi-user exposure therapy. Let's put more than one user in VR and see how they could, be, uh, they could go into exposure therapy. A 3D UR exposure therapy for VR. So a 3D UR that this clinician uses to control what the other guy, what the, what the uh, client is seeing in VR and control the experience, communicate with the experience, both of them in the VR environment. Classroom in VR for a child who showed disruptive behavior, turn taking training in VR, similar to social study, and then they find the multi user interactive VR classroom. So these are the interventions that have been developed past the three years. Not all of them have been totally tested. None of them have been long, have been true longitudinal test, but most of them have been true pilot test to find if there is a potential. So I go through the papers now. Paper A. Uh, I just want to look into what VR has been used for before before I start doing anything. I want to understand not just for our system, but within clinic, clinical VR, what has been done. And then I learned that already in the beginning of the 90s, or even before that. But most of the beginning of that, there has been lots of studies on exposure therapy for individuals suffering from anxiety disorders. There has been so many interesting wars with the aerophobia, the claustrophobia, and so on, uh, because it makes sense. You put, you're afraid of something. And there are also studies that show that the exposure therapy in VR today is, as, is better than uh, exposure therapy when you have to imagine being somewhere else. And is often as good as in vivo training, where you actually take that person, if you can, if you have the possibility, to that place where they are afraid of. So it has shown that it works super nice uh, for this specific alignment, exposure therapy. Then I learned post-stroke rehabilitation. If you lost the function in some part of your body, you can uh, be motivated to do these boring, boring rehearsals in VR. I tried to break my hand several times and I've been doing this kind of rehearsals, super boring. I wish I had some VR back then. Substance use disorder, that was a huge surprise for me. Uh, if you are a drug abuser, if you like, if you are uh, whatever, then you can uh, be, you can do Q exposure therapy in VR. Whoa, that's super interesting. Because for instance, whenever I am in a bar, I feel like a beer. But if you give me a bar VR experience after, and then I try that for a couple of weeks without getting my beer, then my brain, uh, according to this theory, uh, excuse, start rewiring and then I don't need a beer. But I don't think it would work for me though. That's good, maybe. PTSD, uh, that's uh, something that's been done a lot. Uh, if you have a traumatic experience, the clinician can take you in that uh, uh, traumatic experience and can work with you to deal with those experiences. Super interesting stuff, especially for veterans, which is terrible. Uh, schizophrenia. Wow, I mean, that was also uh, mind-blowing for me because, of course, there's this huge problem that you see things, you hear voices and so on, but then a clinician can actually take your hand and go through these experiences with you and then help you deal with them, help you. For instance, if you hear voices, the clinician can talk through those voices and then talk to no through normal voices and try to help you uh, understand, uh, like understand why you heard these words and get rid of them. I mean... I just found it uh, fascinating. ADHD assessment and generally assessment of different uh, uh, 
uh, diagnosis, these different uh, problems. Um, this classroom here, there was uh, lots of uh, disrupt dis disturbing uh, events going around. For instance, the door opening, somebody drawing with paper uh, pieces, somebody driving a bus outside. And then the, the, the test was conducted to see typically developed children compared to ADHD children who would get distracted the most. Super simple, super interesting. Of course, the ADHD children got distracted more than typically developed children in the VR environment. So now I knew what VR has been used for before, then I tried to delve into autism with second paper, second publication. And that one, uh, I, I understood, I mean, I, I did the work, I published it later. But I, I, when working on these topics of, in this publication, I learned that about the traditional methods and also I learned some of the pros, some of the powers of VR when working with children with autism. One of these powers is motivation. I, I heard several times from the teachers I've worked with that their students with autism, whenever there's a new game, they simply love playing the new game. They love to try it. They want to play with it. Uh, they know all the movies, all this visual stuff. They are motivated towards them, but they're not as motivated to show up in a real traditional classroom to learn stuff. Also, Leo Kenner, in his original paper from 1940s, where he described these 13 uh, children with autism, he described them as you know, being mostly inside themselves, like ignoring their parents, don't looking at them, but they loved looking at people inside the magazines, uh, pictures of people. So they attended more to pictures of people than they attended real people. That's super. And so the motivation is there for this kind of technologies. Individual training, the spectrum is so broad, I can make specific training that uh, live up to those specific needs that some part of this group has. Hierarchical delivery of training, can make, let's say, a supermarket with no people, and then we can increase that gradually depending on their needs. It's also relevant for the individualized training. I learned that it's more safe, but of course, it, you know, <laughs> it's more safe to get a hit by a car in the VR than get hit by a car in the real life. Should be careful with the false sense of safety. Uh, so it's very hard to design how should the consequences in VR be when you get hit with the car. And of course, it's the safety from people as well. If you are autistic and you feel uncomfortable around people in VR, no people. It's you and technology, you are immersed in this world. Uh, and then independent training outside of the clinician's office or schools. You can train from home. You can train uh, from wherever you want. Uh, and then, uh, for instance, some of these things we did, it was multiplayer people could log in from different environments. And then training data, I can take this training data and give to these beautiful teachers and they can use it to make better interventions for the students because they might get to know their students better. And also I can use it to create the next iteration, next studies that I'm going to conduct. Okay, what should we look at next? So with knowing this, I set out to find out what skills should we look for when working with this target group. And again, I've been so lucky to get so much awesome, great feedback from uh, these teachers. And this paper, I, I tried to put together all this feedback they gave me and categorize what skills and desires they felt was could be trained with VR. So these teachers had experience using VR. They, uh, they have tried it, they have played around with it, and then they had so many great, great, great ideas that I just, you know, yes, yes, let's look at that. Can it be done? I don't know, let's do a study. Let's develop an intervention, do a study, figure out if it has potential or not. And uh, daily living skills, social skills, and academic skills. These are the three categories that came out of it. And, you know, I just took some of them and start running with them. Uh, and the first, uh, well, before you start doing this kind of stuff, one thing about VR is that I can take these helmets on, and then I'm, I can pick up an item with my hand mid-air, grabbing it, putting it down. So it's a mid-air interaction. There are no traditional buttons, handles, uh, whatever. For instance, with the new Oculus Quest, there is hand tracking, so you don't even have the buttons that you used to have. Now it's just a hand. So you do all this mid-air interaction, which is, has so much potential. But would children and our adolescents with autism accept those? So this study was done to investigate whether they would, how it would compare to a traditional method of interaction, touchscreen. So we created an intervention, uh, which uh, had a version on touchscreen and a version using Kinect, which could be interacted with mid-air. Uh, and it was a simple uh, inter uh, interface where you could uh, navigate through a set of music instruments by pressing right and left arrow, and then you could pick one instrument, you could hear the sound. Very simple. Then we did some studies. I'm not going to get into that because of time and the other stuff, but we did a study to investigate uh, the usability and the user experience of these interventions. To make it sure, we found out much higher usability in the touchscreen intervention, but higher enjoyment in the 
touchless intervention, which makes sense because they are not used to the touchless intervention. And hopefully, hopefully, perhaps they can actually gain the same usability after being exposed to these kind of technologies for some time. This led us to develop the next uh, study, or uh, go towards the next study, which is creating a supermarket and see if VR supermarket could be immersive HMD-based VR supermarket could be used to teach shopping. And this supermarket is designed to look similar, again, specific training for specific needs of a specific group. We work with a group of students from Royal Municipality. There was a vertex close to the school that uh, it's a super Danish supermarket close to their school that they used to usually go and buy stuff from. So we created this supermarket to look similar to that supermarket. And on the right, you see the virtual supermarket. On the left, you see the other supermarket. The, the, all, all the items were textured. Uh, the rectangular items were easy to texture. You could just take a picture of each side. The round items, uh, the co-author Emil, he bought some of these items, brought them home, put them inside a bucket of water, waited till the, what is it, the, the, the labels disattached themselves, dried them, photographed them, put them back in the Unity to, to put them on the shelves there. But it was created and then in order to create common stimuli, Instead of giving them two VR controllers, in one hand, they hold a real shopping basket that they borrowed from the supermarket. Uh, and uh, attached uh, one of the sensors to that. So when they move that left hand uh, holding a shopping basket, they could see a real shopping basket in their headset being moved around as if they were really holding it. And then uh, on the other hand, they hold the shopping list. They could navigate around the supermarket and finish these shopping. They could navigate around by walking or teleportation. And they could grab the objects put them in their basket, move on to the next slide. And uh, the audio, terrible. It's the same sound everywhere in the supermarket. Some of the students told us, but I cannot hear the cashier when I'm over here. <laughs> but yeah. So you see, we didn't do the whole supermarket, but a section of it. But uh, then we did a study of this in a real supermarket where we took the kids out shopping. They never met us, but the, the teachers took them out and we asked them to time how fast they could shop a certain shopping list and how many right items they got back from that shopping list. Also, we hit uh, around the supermarket and we had some, we called some quality data. The, the children have never seen us, we never seen them, but we gave them this huge shopping list with distinguishable colors. So we could see, okay, red is over there, he's doing something. So we got quality data. Half of the population, we only had nine participants because it's not easy for my project to get many participants. Uh, five of them uh, tried VR training. Uh, Four of them did not get the ER training. They went to normal supermarket trips. And then we went to a supermarket again and co collect the same amount of data. Because of small, our small sample size, we could not see any uh, like any difference that, I, that our vote's discussing here. But the best thing that happened, I mean, of course, our treatment group got a little bit better, but nothing significant per se. But the best thing that happened was that participant D, who has a low-functioning autistic individual, in, during the baseline, he refused to walk into the supermarket. He asked a teacher to give, get his hand, otherwise he would not go in. A teacher had to bring him around and uh, pick up the items with him. Then he trained with this thing here, uh, we created. And then afterwards on the second attempt, he went in and he did uh, all the shopping himself. And that was like the biggest thing that came out of this study that that guy, after trying it, he was like, oh shit, I tried this before. I remember that, let me, let me go. I know where that is, I know where this is. He went in and he did it. That was super nice to see. But one thing is finding your items. Another thing is paying for them, so using money. So the next study, also the teachers told me that that's a problem for even the 18, 19 year olds. That's a problem, you know, purchasing. Some of them stand there, they ask for 20 kronas. They, ha uh, they have uh, the coin for the 20, but they start picking out once, 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 once and going a bit done. So could we do something in VR to train them with them? And I say, yes, uh, I met them and, uh, and then some nice teachers and we discussed. So tell me, what do you want? I can do this and that and then take the technology allow this and that and that. So towards a, like a user-centered workshop, this design workshop. And first of all, they told me that when they train these kind of skills with their students, they use uh, money from Monopoly to role play purchasing with them. And then they do cutouts from uh, supermarket uh, magazines. And then they ask them, if you were to buy this and that, how many Monopoly money would you give me? 
okay, we can do that in VR with real Danish, Danish money that you can pick up and place in front of somebody. Can we do that? Uh, and then uh, that somebody can have real products in front of him. And once you pay him, he can give you some positive reinforcements by dancing and saying thank you. Uh, can we do that? And I, that, that, that was very natural for me to say. But then they told me, yes. They told me something I have never could have imagined by myself. They told me, could we do another level before that? Because that's too hard. That can be too hard for them. Can we do a level where you simply have to pick up the coins and bills and place it on the table with the images of that bill or coin? Just simple matching game. Sure. I mean, great. Let's do that. But really, is that a problem? That's surprising. That was the beginning of my time working with this target group. And it was, I'm so thankful and grateful for this knowledge that keeps coming to me. And we did that. And uh, so each time they place it on the right table, uh, they place it on the right table, the green light turn up and say, ding. If you press on the wrong table, it said red until they did it right. After that, I said, can we now go to my bazaar guy? Uh, and then they said, no, no, let's have another level that instead of pictures have the numbers. Perfect, great idea, loved it, did it, uh, put it in there and it's got some great observation and it, it worked. The it, students, they did it. But, and then, then once they finished those two levels, they got into this final level. They had their hands using the controller, quite immersive. Three krona, they could see how much they need to pay. Then they could pick up, uh, the uh, one kroner, they love throwing these items around. And that's a two kroner and that's a one, so it becomes three. Tag for there. And I, I, I put voice over. That bliver 10 kroner, tag. And there were five dance animation that I triggered randomly between the five. And after some time, if they didn't pay the right amount, some... Uh, Tag for there. Some feedback would trigger. Uh, Telling them, oh, you still need two kroner. You still need five kroner. And if they didn't get it, they did it still, it would tell them explicitly, give me one of the 10 kroners or, and one of the five kroners or whatever they needed. Uh, or the teachers could also activate them using the keyboard, the guides. Tag for there. There's the Gangnam style. And there are five in total. Det bliver 110 kroner. Tag. So... And then there was the bills, of course. But uh, then I did a study on this to try to uh, investigate the measure, the skill with real Danish money before and after the training, uh, two weeks, five sessions, 10 minutes each. And, uh, and, and, and the study is uh, inspired by another study uh, investigating another money uh, training method. Uh, as where you uh, role play with them with real money, give them uh, 13 prizes and ask them to pay the amount of prizes, uh, uh, amount of bills and coins, and then you count how many right and wrongs they did. And the results before and after, very nice. I mean, I only again had five participants. Then there can be so many reasons for this improvement, of course. But I mean, I enjoyed the results, but, but I'm, I'm not satisfied because I needed to do studies where I, for instance, uh, give them a task in the real life, for instance, uh, give them a task after a longer time. Also, I just said they have a problem with imagination. So they have a hard time imagining verbal instruction. And what do I do? I give them verbal instruction when they not, don't know how to uh, solve the problem. I tell them, oh, you can give me a 10 and a 5 verbally. I should show it to them. It should be visual. The product, the AI, the virtual agent should be more intelligent than what I created. But who is the most intelligent virtual AI? Well, I thought the teacher. <laughs> the teacher can go in and take over the role of the salesman by controlling uh, avatar you wearing the head mounted display. From the school, the child can come in from, the, from home, from the safety of his home. You can create a whole supermarket where you can do the whole shopping here. Uh, pick up the items, go up to this guy, and then you have a student here with a screen, how much he has to pay. The teacher here, they both control uh, avatar using head-mounted displays. And then the teacher scans the products, you take your wallet, and then the teacher can teach however he wants to teach. He can ask the student, show me your wallet. Oh, you have to give me one of those. I'm, I, I'm not a teacher. The teachers know what to say, but I give them the sandbox they need for this. Uh, and then this is the point of view of the teacher, uh, of the student. He has his wallet, he see how much uh, money has to be paid and he can see the teacher. And the point of view of the teacher, he can scan the products. So this is uh, the next natural step and then let more students be in there. 
let them train uh, being in a crowded supermarket where there are actually real people locked into the same virtual environment. And it's possible today with Unity and VR and stuff like that, we can develop this kind of stuff. Practice standing in line, for instance. So all of this stuff, those are, this is, uh, yeah, this is going to be worked further on in the future. Another thing I looked at and I was told by the teacher was traffic safety. Especially uh, Skomo's school, and I was told that they had huge problems with traffic safety. So, and they were so nice to invite me there uh, for uh, for a meeting, for a workshop, design workshop. But I wanted to them to tell me what they needed, how they do it now, what are the requirements, so I could set a set of requirement specification based on their feedback. I brought a couple, a couple of headsets uh, where they tried, for instance, the money training, and then they gave me so much valuable information. For instance, one of the requirements was similar to the video modeling, they wanted me to create an intervention where the child could see the 3D, somebody doing it the right way first. So somebody else performing the right street crossing. So I created this guy uh, called him Jens. And then Jens, in the beginning, you take it out, you're on the street. Jens show you how to cross the street correctly, how to look left and right. Then they wanted me to create something where the child has to try it himself. There should be visual cues, big visual cues, a moving arrow, where is the cross section? And then finally, we should have cars, uh, somehow intelligent cars. So uh, they are intelligent. They stop sometimes, more often when there is somebody at the cross section, sometimes not like real, some people do. And straight lights. And then. Ovein, skal du først gå over til en fuggingaoffelt, som Jens her vil gøre om lidt. Nu skal Jens både kigge først til venstre og bagefter til højre. In han går vejen. I use a dance animation from the money train to put it on this guy. But yeah. Nu er det din tur. Prøv at gå over til frygningerfeltet. Der hvor det blinker. Først skal du kigge til venstre. Og så skal du kigge til højre. Nu må du gerne gå over vejen. Du skal først gå over til vejkanten og kigge til begge sider, indtil der ikke kommer flere biler. Nu skal du vente til alle bilerne holder helt stille. Først skal du kigge til venstre. Og så skal du kigge til højre. Nu må du gerne gå over vejen. So this is published, but it still needs work before I dare to test it on real children because it's such a, you know, special topic. I'm too afraid to test it yet. I need some more professional improvement, improve, improvements than the teachers. I, all I did was based on teach the teachers and the school's ethical rules. But we need more confirmation, but this is published as it is, as like a you know description of a user-centered design uh, for a VR application. Something. The next intervention, social stories in VR, turn-taking. Uh, can we, uh, together with some teachers, we created an intervention where the teachers could try, uh, that the students could uh, practice turn-taking similar to the social story method. So we created this uh, classroom to look similar to the real classroom, as you see, but more cartoonish. Then you, there are three scenarios that can be activated by the teacher. The teacher is not in VR in this version. The teacher is controlling it on the keyboard and mouse. But the teacher can activate several scenarios. He can talk to the kid first of all. Then he can tell the kid, grab the computer from that guy. If he does it, this guy would go sad. I was playing. Why did you take it? And then the teacher can talk to him about whatever the teachers talk to this <laughs> about something, something be nice. And then the teacher could then ask, then ask him verbally the next time. Try again. Try to ask him. May I borrow your computer? And then this guy would say, uh, then the teacher could press J, J for yes, Danish yes, and N for no. If you press uh, J, the guy would say, yes, there you go. If you press N, the guy would say, no, now I'm playing. And the kid could always uh, learn because the teacher could talk to him. This is a sandbox for the teacher to work with the child. Social story, but the child is inside the social story. And then in this one, the child is playing a game himself a color game, uh, blue, then you have to press the blue button. Once the teacher feels that he's engaged, you press a button and then this other guy comes and shut down the computer. And then the teacher can talk to him about how it is 
when somebody comes in and shut down the computer when you are using it without asking for permission first. Uh, so yeah, like, and now this guy is going south. No, I was playing. The teacher can talk to him and and tell him whatever teachers do. And uh, this thing was evaluated by uh, five by two teachers and five students. Here is where he's playing himself. And then when teacher advances, he can activate the sequence where the other guy closes the computer. And this was tested on two teachers who used it as a social story method on five students. And uh, based on the quality data we got on from them, also we gave them some questionnaires, but, they, uh, but they, based on the quality data, we could see that the teachers felt like the students were really in the social story. They were really in the shoes of the guy who was being rejected or who was giving the turn or whose computer was shut down without uh, permission and so on. So it has some huge potential need to work further on it, perhaps put a teacher inside that virtual avatar where he can control it using his uh, uh, head mounted display and so on. And there are potentials here for next iterations as well. Then anxiety. I mean, the anxiety has been like the holy grail of virtual reality exposure therapy, performing in front of the audience, but with active uh, voice. So this one, you start in an empty room, then uh, my voice starts out saying, hey, once uh, you guys are ready, say ready, then the audience will come in. You can in Unity implement simple ready uh, detection, phrase detection. So once they say ready, it would uh, activate these guys walking in. They sit down, you start singing. And if you, s there were eight animation that switched, uh, not very beautiful animations, uh, but, but they worked. And if you, if you didn't sing, look for amplitude of the sound of the system. If the amplitude was low, this guy would go like this, and go like this. But if the amplitude went higher and higher, they would start clapping. At some point, they would just go like, uh, you know, totally uh, party, party mode if you are shouting. And we did a study on this uh, very primary, primary study on only three students that I could get uh, in their 1890s, uh, 18 and 19. <laughs> uh, and uh, they were capable of thinking. And one of the nonverbal guys was uh, even motivated to hum just to get these guys to move. And that was super nice to see. There are potentials. Next was so lucky to be able to go and record the Danish national children choirs. Uh, singing sessions using a nice 360 camera and the uh, ambient microphone. And uh, uh, we got uh, some sessions like this. And then we, we made them several recordings. One when you are in the front row, when you're back row, one when you're standing in front of everybody else, uh, and one where you're standing in the loose corner, uh, loose circle, close circle, back, front, 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 like in front of everybody. And then we were so lucky that several other psychologists, such as Sean, they wanted to give us some feedback uh, for this publication. And what Sean told us, which was the most valuable thing, again, because we are um, I'm a meteorologist, I had no idea about this. Improvise, control, and communication. That's the most important thing when you create this kind of stuff. Uh, you need to be able to co communicate with the child all the time. You need to be able to improvise. You need to be able to control what the child is experiencing. So we need to give the psychologist more power. But can we do that uh, in VR? So we put him inside the virtual environment. And then he got the uh, interface in VR where he could change the scenes, as you see here, change the volume. He could see the avatar of his client. And what he did in that same virtual environment, they were both in the same video virtual environment. Then he could change the video again, boom. Now in, in, in the one with their, that they are standing closer to each other. And then we compare these two, we compared a traditional interface using mouse and keyboard with a 3D UI interface. I mean, in this version, in the traditional version, the, Somebody's sound is on. In the traditional version, there is a uh, there is only screen based, but in the but in the other version, uh, it's a uh, it's, it's 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 he's in VR. So there is a screen based versus the VR based version. And we investigated whether we did a qualitative study on several psychologists, and what they told us is that uh, using this, they feel like much more when they wore the VR headset themselves. And they could see the avatar, and the, av uh, the child could see their avatar. They feel like they could, they could potentially be able to 
control the experience, feel what the child feels, and so on. However, the usability of this was definitely not as good as the usability of this one, because in this one, they could use mouse to press these items, wearing the head-mounted displays, and then using a controller to press the buttons on this interface was not as easy for them. But hopefully, after some time, but they had a hard time navigating. They couldn't as easily navigate the scene, so look around using the mouse, the 360 scene, compared to then wearing the HMD. So there are some potentials here that we will investigate further in the future. Finally, I had this uh, publication where a school at Rodo Municipality had this disruptive ch child and he would throw objects around, he would curse, he would shout, he would beat the other children, he would beat. I heard some scary, scary stories uh, from the, one of the teachers, Bo, who, who was the main motivator of this. And he told me that they had to take him out, the teachers, they had to take him out of the classroom to calm him down. Then you have the teacher leaving the classroom and uh, the, student, the rest of the students don't receive their education. So that's not very good for the classroom and the education in general. They tried to give him one-to-one -one education, but he was still being disruptive. Uh, so the idea was, okay, what if we put him inside a virtual environment, the child together with the teacher, place a big screen in there, and then uh, use some of the traditional uh, interactive uh, learning materials they already use, such as book uh, creator or uh, school tube, to, to use some of the learning methods uh, using big screen VR, which is a consumer application. You can uh, simply navigate uh, and place, uh, it, you can use it as a computer. And then they could make some, uh, some of the learning, Danish learning material. You could do some exercises, you could learn stuff, the teacher could teach him stuff in that shit. Yeah. Ah, du er faktisk ret skrab, ellers så havde du ikke nået så langt, jo. He's saying that, oh, you're actually quite good, uh, otherwise you wouldn't have made it this uh, long. And he's doing some tasks, he's saying, Mo, must. Er du god, Baran? The side er tablets are not working here. So he's moving the stuff around and... Men, så ser vi bare pyt, og så trykker du videre. Det er super godt, Baran. During this session, he was not destructive at all. He was still self-criticizing, but he didn't throw the controller, he didn't hit anyone just sat there and did the exercises. And that was uh, mind blowing. Uh, and he, but he still, when they took him back to the real classroom, he was still being disruptive, unfortunately. But that's not in the future. I mean, imagine being able to create a classroom here. This is a school from Rolo, a CU. On the left, you see the uh, real classroom. On the right, you see the virtual classroom. Then we can create rich uh, multi-user interventions where the students can from safety from their home, if they are too afraid to go there, from the safety of their home, they can come here and then interact with the teacher, control the avatar, the teacher controls the avatar. It's in their school that they might go to at some point. The teacher can use this to, uh, as a playground to do whatever a teacher does. You can use the whiteboard here. The whiteboard is interactive. You can draw on it. You can play YouTube videos or use the screen similar to the big screen VR here. You can grab the fruits and throw at each other. It's super fun to throw stuff in VR. Uh, and you can do, uh, you know, interact with these guys. And this guy, this girl, she was at the, at the school and I was at the multisensory experience lab in, in, at the university and we were playing together. Uh, no, I can grab it, yeah. Oops. Okay. Are we, are we there where we take the afgørende crucible spill? Men yeah, too. Okay. And they are talking yeah. back to me. They are asking who should start. Okay. They can do it or do it. Yeah. Boom. Boom. Spændende, spændende, spændende. Det er også sådan. Can I put on a YouTube video? Everybody hears the music and look how they react. Then they start some of them. Oh, what's going on on the screen? And she's doing. And I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> But in the future, the teacher can bring all the students together in this virtual classroom, more than one student. And he can control it as if it's the matrix. He can put whatever prop he needs in that room that re he requires for that specific topic he wants to teach the students. Or he can take them on field trips to the supermarket. Like, hello, welcome to Nature. We are going to shop at the Furtex. Let's go. Boom. Now we are in Furtex. 
Now we are on the street, let's practice crossing the street. Now we are with the Danish National Children Choir, we can practice singing. Now we are at any of these places you want. I mean, they can create so many interventions, so many different needs. The teacher can just, boom, take them on that specific place that he wants to work with that specific day. The thing is, in the future, I, I really want to do more longitudinal studies on these things, figure out, uh, first of all, more, st uh, more participants uh, uh, to get some nice data, and also on, on over time, how positive effect will this have? I would like to uh, study this across cultures. I mean, uh, would they work, I'm from Iran, would they work on autistic kids in Iran? Would they work at your place in California? I would love to be able to sense, I mean, work together and figure out if they could, uh, but studies over there would give the same results as studies over here or in Iran or whatever. So, I mean, the future is open, but I think now my 45 minutes uh, plus some taxes is gone. So I will stop it here and hope that we can have a nice break. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Eddie, for a really interesting, really, really interesting presentation. And um, I can really feel your energy through the screen. That's a nice experience. <laughs> now I know you're also in the physical world, but I, I think we can really feel this is something you really, you really uh, care about and really have done a lot of studies in. So I wish uh, yeah. I could see you in real life. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a nice experience. Um, despite we have to do it this way due to uh, the corona situation. Now, uh, as I said, we, uh, we will have a 10-minute break, uh, barrier break. Uh, and if there are anybody from the audience who has a question, you have to give it to me during the break, and I can, I can look if there are any questions. And then when we come back to the... After the break, we will come back and... Uh, the panel will start to uh, ask you questions and hopefully we'll get a good discussion about your PhD study. So see you in uh, 10 minutes. So that will be five minutes past six in Denmark and five, min five minutes past nine in California. <laughs> okay, so 10 minutes. So, um, Welcome to um, the second part of the PhD defense by Ali, and uh, we uh, have two hours now for questions, discussions. We don't need to use all the two hours, but that's the, the limit. And uh, first, um, I will give the, the word to Skip Riso. Then Mireide Nordhoff will follow up with her questions, and Last, Georges will end the session. I've not received anything from the audience, so I think that will be, uh, be how we'll conduct the, the defense. So please skip the, the word is yours. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes fine. All righty. Well, first off, um, I, I want to thank you for inviting me to participate in this um, this exceptional project and dissertation and so forth um you know i'm uh i'm kind of awestruck by the breadth of uh the approach and uh the period of time in which it was done i know people that have um you know been doing this work for many years and have probably dreamed about creating applications to address each of these areas but for whatever reason whether it's funding or time or other responsibilities it's always been a dream myself included in many ways um and so to see this much work done um, in this brief period of time albeit that you know it is pilot prototype data but it serves um serves a great foundation for future work i believe and so that opens uh the first question here and um, I think uh, we discussed yesterday about 15 minutes or so uh, for questioning. Um, first question I have is you've built all these really cool things of any one particular environment target. If you had to focus on that for the next two years, 
with the aim of running a, a larger scale randomized controlled trial to test efficacy and effectiveness. What would it be? What would be the rationale for that? Uh, what's your decision making on that? Is it, you know, what's easy or is it what's most important? Or I don't want to give too many uh, multiple choice <laughs> options here. So I hear you talk about that. Thing is, I have done several different things, and I have left them all. <laughs> I, and I, there's so much I want to go back to. The money training, it's very close to my heart because I saw some improvement, but I did not get the nice data. I, I mean, I did not do the nice studies I wanted. Also, I can see the flaws of the money training, and I can see how it could be improved with the new version where I could uh, Im merge uh, some of my applications, the one with the supermarket can be merged together with the money training uh, on the long term, uh, where we can create a multi-user intervention where the, you can have some social anxiety in there. If you have more avatars walking around, controlled by real people perhaps, that can be used to train some other social skills uh, other than just uh, money training or, or shopping. And shopping is also a very important skill for independent adulthood. These guys, when they get older, if they want to be able to take care of themselves they need to be they need to be uh, able to shop their own do their own grocery basically this is one of them the other thing is i want to finish the traffic safety because it's such a dangerous thing and such a important topic to work on and such a sensitive topic as well and i really want to get uh, in uh, contact uh, i try i'm trying to get in contact with the danish uh, what you call it ministry of traffic safety uh, so I'm, I'm trying to get in dialogue with them to help me design and finish this application and help me do studies. I need their guidelines for that. And I would really like to create, finish that because the prototype is there and the, the core elements, but I need to make sure that everything is okay before I do that. And then I want to do studies where I, on a longer period of time, see if this effect can be generalized from the virtual environment to real world environment because you know transfer of knowledge and generalization is one of the one of the flaws of uh, one of the things that they have difficulties with children with autism from one context to another context uh, and and let's say the street I create will not be similar to, to the street they live at so maybe they go like oh shit man this is not the street I'm training that uh, what do I do now can we create something that will make it easier for them to transfer knowledge from the virtual environment into the into the real world environment. Uh, and that requires uh, more participants, longer time, uh, more resources in general. Uh, so I, and I hope to get that by just reaching out to everyone I can. Uh, anxiety, of course, is something. But no, I think I'm, I want to keep for the future the supermarket combined with the money training, combined with some social skills. The traffic safety, the classroom has huge potentials, creating a classroom where the teacher can do whatever the teachers want to do and then take them to the supermarket, take them to the traffic safety, take them to something uh, uh, you guys create in uh, the other side of the world, <laughs> in the virtual environment you guys create over there. You know, so, so just to maybe create a base where everyone can log into, because I see lots of potential also for these multi-user interventions. Uh, where, where there are the, the clinicians, teachers, they can control different avatars, play different roles. There was this study by Didabani uh, where they play Second Life, based on something so simple as Second Life using mouse and keyboard. And then the therapist, they play the role of a child uh, who lost his dog in the park. And then the autistic 16-year-old, uh, he would uh, walk around with the you know, first-person shooter controllers, basically, or a joystick. It would walk towards and then oh there's a child crying and then the, the therapist could talk and say i lost my dog what should we do and then they could practice also, but, but we can give the therapist the power to be immersed in vr together with the child and then play different roles play the role of teachers uh i'm probably not going to look into virtual agents because uh, I, I feel like that how much work i need to do to create something that is usable it's, I mean, I will not be capable of doing that. So I think for me personally, I will look into more giving the control to the teachers to doing some AI and uh, virtual avatar. Sorry. Yeah. That, that brings me to the, the follow on to this from a de design perspective. Um, what do your, your clinical user group, not the, not the uh, direct users, but the uh, clinicians and care providers, what, what do you think works best? For them, in terms of controlling 
the stimulus presentation within these virtual environments. Um, you know, going from a completely automated process that can be set and sent to users' behavior and update and change the stimulus challenge level in the environment, or on the other end of the continuum, a pure Wizard of Oz approach that would allow the clinicians to control in real time the events in the world, uh, kind of like what you might do in an exposure therapy application where you can, the clinician in real time can change uh, the speed of the cars or the, as you mentioned, uh, the impact of distraction, noise, uh, crowds in a supermarket environment. Um, where, where do you see the, the from their perspective, uh, would be the best direction. Uh, you know, I think there, there's issues about automation um, and even clinicians now wondering what their their future will be like in an automated uh, AI world. Um, is there room for clinicians or is that the best interface for pacing the types of challenges that you present in these environments and adjusting the ambient stimuli that are in these worlds or should it be automated or should you just have levels? You know, you get through one level of one challenge, you go to the next, that's sort of the middle ground. Yeah, but I was uh, surprised to see how, I mean, the, the, for instance, the money training, it didn't, uh, the, there wasn't that much, it was automated. Uh, so after I think 45 seconds or something, if they didn't do it right, the system would tell them with my voice, oh, you still need to give me 15 kronas. I spent like a half a day just saying everything from 15 uh, cents, Danish cents to 200 kronas in voice. So the system could say exactly how much was needed and say it out loud. And the system could do that, but it felt uh, robotic. It didn't feel right. It didn't trigger the right behavior from them. And then after I think 30 more seconds, the system would say with my voice again, you can give me one of the 10 krona coins and one of the other ones. Still nothing. And that's, that was the highest level of intelligence <laughs> the system had. Then the system was like, okay, now I give up. I cannot do anything more. If it was a teacher, he could take over from there and do whatever was required for the student to understand. So my personal belief is that I might be biased because I'm not an AI programmer, <laughs> but my personal belief is that we should give the power to the teachers, to the clinicians to perform because they know I, I, I think that we are, we, of course we are there to create awesome AI programs, but I think there's still somewhere from replacing the psychologists, the psychiatrists, the, the clinicians, the teachers with AI, because they, they we still need the human human to human contact, even though we are in a virtual world and we're talking about something different. It's that the human to human and the empathy. The, of course, we are working on programming empathy, creating empathy in AI, but the empathy that teachers have, the clinicians have. Uh, cannot be replaced, but it can be transferred into the virtual world. Oh, that's super nice if you can do that. Transfer their empathy and skills into the virtual world. Give them the tools required to control the avatar that will not as stress out this, the, the, the child, the, the teenager, and then uh, perform the, the whatever it is you need to perform to help that child learn whatever desired skills you want him to learn. I feel that's the future. But of course, at some point there might be automated AI I try to make automated levels uh, based on the feedback from teachers uh, with, again, with the money, with the matching game. Uh, it works, but you know they still got stuck and the system didn't do anything to help them out of it. If there was a teacher, he could have done a lot more to help them. Uh, and also if, you know, like a game, I mean, it can have certain amount of functionality, but at some point it runs out. But if you create a sandbox for a teacher in the VR world, he can find new activities to do in the same intervention, same implementation. Also, I think my biggest, biggest dream perhaps is to give the power to the teachers and the clinician to create their own virtual environments so they right. don't need me, right? <laughs> that's the, right, right. And then, then I'm right. out of job, so that's not so much. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if you want to give that away. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, with that in mind, though, um, you know, we do face issues of, um, at least the United States, which might not be representative of the rest of the world, but we have issues of um, human resource challenges, not having enough clinicians for the number of people that need services. So do you see, what, what's your view towards 
taking something that you've modeled with clinician interaction uh, to learn how a clinician might change or respond things, um, but uh, to build in parallel self-training, independent practice, so that you know a clinician may get the ball rolling, uh, but if you make the environment compelling enough, perhaps the, the user will have you know the impetus to want to practice or play the game or beat the performance on their own. What, what's your view towards that? Because I know in in, in general areas of um, of you know clinical care, there's always this dynamic tension between what um, accessibility of treatment. A lot of people don't seek treatment that could benefit from it. And um, should we push more treatment out the door with some level of supervision? Um, or do we integrate this as, uh, you know, two sides of the same coin? Mm. There's lots of potential in training, uh, training on the data from the clinicians, these AIs. So they begin to perform more and more like they would have. And of course, the pro one thing, for instance, the supermarket thing, the multiplayer one, I designed it for the teacher. Then I asked him, what do you think about this? Just to have some data about the design. And he told me, it's super nice. I can do this. I can do that. I can do this. But then because he's time, he's alone in the school. He don't have, as you mentioned, they're understaffed. Then he said, oh, and also I can use one of the students who is more high functioning to take over the cashier so I can go and do my paperwork or do whatever right. else I need. And I was like, oh, okay, sure, you, you lazy, lazy tour. Uh, I love you tour if you're listening. And he's a nice teacher, but yeah, because they are busy, busy and understaffed uh, and they don't have the resources required. So they, of course they're looking for some way to, you know, what do you call it? Uh, get rid of some of all these tasks they have. Uh, we, also, uh, we also have some of these issues in Denmark with teachers, especially being overwhelmed with work in general. And if you could do something, some activities, some, I mean, I, I believe some activities, some, some, some simple activities can be guided and designed in a way so that the system provides nice enough gu guidelines to these guys. The problem is the low functioning ones and the variety of autism and also the low function environments uh, we might need so much uh, something that the system might not have thought of <laughs> and that's uh, that's based on my very little experience in the past three years that uh, the system might, al might always uh, uh, encounter a child a teenager who have specific needs that we didn't thought about at all if i was a teacher i could react in it uh, over there but of course, after training or the data after for a long time, perhaps we can have a, a system that can react to any kind of uh, problems someone might have on the on this uh, spectrum. But it's, I mean, yeah, it's a super interesting question. But uh, yeah, I'm <laughs> I'm still uh, leaning towards allowing the teacher being there. But I totally see the potentials of having this automated system to take care of some of the tasks, some of the skills, some some of the stuff that the to to mm -hmm. yeah. The yeah. Musical. By the way, just so you know, I'm I'm not advocating for eliminating <laughs> clinicians with AI. I think uh, we we're at our peril if we don't acknowledge that AI can amplify our capabilities mm -hmm. and provide uh, experiences for when the clinician is not available. And so, you know, I think that's a reasonable approach to learn from direct clinical intervention and try to build things that can supplement. The amount of time that's available for a clinician. Um, okay, let's take a little bit of a different turn here. Um, you know, certainly, I'm sure you've, you know, we all run into a lot of people that are excited and enamored about virtual reality and totally get it. They're the early adopters or the people that are digging in the trenches that love the idea of advancing uh, what we can do clinically with uh, technology. But there's also people on the other side. Um, that you know, view this as uh, you know something that'll never succeed, that will be problematic in a lot of ways. And I'd like you to tell me what you see. Uh, just give me a listing of the types of critiques that these people might present to you, and how you would counter them. Uh, one thing I heard was the removal of empathy. That the system will never be as empathic as a real person. But then uh, again, I, 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 I'm, I'm totally again biased towards the other one. So I have an argument for that, which is 
I mean, let's say I get old and I break my back and I cannot, I'm sorry, I cannot go to the bathroom by myself. So if a technology could help me go to the bathroom because I have broken my back or whatever, and there was a robot that could help me do whatever I need to do, I feel like it's more, I mean, I feel if it's more empathy there in compared to if there was a human being there helping me, I would feel uncomfortable. And also the same with autism, if there's a human being there, the child might not, I mean, all the empathy that person might have, the child is autistic. He's not reading it. He's suffering, uh, trying to analyze all this data is coming from our face. So the empathy is not there. But the, what else? I mean, the sense of being being in the real world togetherness, I, I have heard that the, I don't meet that many of those kind of people, luckily. Uh, I, because maybe they try to be nice to me. I don't know, but I haven't. Yeah, right, that. right. <laughs> But the empathy thing I heard before. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I mean, uh, luckily, no. And I think more and more uh, people uh, are getting, uh, I used to, I, I live uh, with Stina here and she was totally against, I mean, she was very critical uh, towards uh, whatever, what the stuff I'm working on uh, back in the days. But now I, I feel like she's getting the point. <laughs> Slowly, I convinced her to get into our team to some extent, not to share. Right. I've never tried the idea before. Yeah, we've run, we've run into this challenge quite a bit with the exposure therapy for PTSD. You know, with a lot of people thinking, "Oh, you're going to re-traumatize somebody with this technology. It's going to be too much." Uh, and none of that is none of that is born in the data. Uh, it's mostly uh, you know shooting from the hip, emotional responding. Um, you know, and I think we're we're finally at a point now after all these years of research where we're showing we're we're do we're not doing harm. We have to be ever vigilant. Uh, but okay, I don't want to use this as a platform for my views. So let me ask you. No, but I, I'm, I'm super interesting <laughs> because you know, that's why. Well, I'm sure. I'm sure we'll have later discussions. Um, what about um, you know? Thus far, all the work that you've done, and that most people that are informed in the area do, is to look at what works in the real world and model that in a VR environment to extend, you know, the principles of knowledge that exist in real world interaction and try to amplify or extend that by the use of technology or make it more accessible, or make it more engaging. Um, do you have any ideas from your work that would be something worth exploring that there isn't a knowledge base that exists, but using the unique properties of VR? And this is a really hard question. I struggle with this a lot of times myself, but I was curious how you would approach the, the issue. Is there, is there an area where you think there is some potential for VR to do something that nobody's ever tried to do in the real world, but might be successful oh. in this area? Yeah. Well, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm, uh, I moved to Denmark as an immigrant. I didn't speak Danish or anything. I've been living in the I had to learn the language and learning a new language in a virtual and the first thing I did back in the days was just simply if I met someone who spoke Danish just point at different objects and ask what's that what's that what's that in VR I can go around grab whatever boom what's that and that can tell me what it is oh, this is a cup oh nice so I can create a vocabulary of words in a fun engaging immersive so learning language learning new cultures Christmas was scary as hell for me, moving from an uh, Islamic country. Uh, first time I was invited to Christmas evening. Whoa, what's going on here? The cultural difference there was huge. And why are they giving presents to each other? What is this tree doing here? I mean, I saw some movies before. But being there the first time <laughs> it was scary in a good way, but it was still, uh, whoa. So if I could get ex exposed, <laughs> exposed to therapy, to new cultures, and we have this whole uh, immigration thing going on, people moving to new places and not being able to integrate into those new places because maybe they are not in, being exposed to that culture. So if we can expose these immigrants into that culture, into these uh, new cultures, like the Danish culture, the American culture, as soon as they get there or even before, <laughs> so to introduce them, how, how do we do it here? How, what are the norms here? Because we, we are so different. We, I mean, the norms and the culture and the background is so different. And I, I didn't know that in the beginning, it took me some time. So VR can be used for cultural and language skills. It's in immigration, I, I see lots of potentials and I wish I could do some work on that at some point because it's close to my heart being one myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, let me see. I've got, I don't want to take too much more time. I want to leave some time here. Um, there was one other question that was really important. Okay, well, let me just, you, you've developed a, a large number of prototypes and you're telling me that the, the money changing and the street crossing um, you think are, are most relevant for the short term. Um, do you do you see what you're doing um, as strictly an academic uh, exercise that you'll do research and understand, you know, how people interact in these environments and what gains can benefit? Or do you have any interest in um, expanding these and working, uh, you know, with um, with commercial entities to develop these types of systems? And if you were to do that, would you have any concerns? Um, about what would you need to do that? Um, I know that uh, in the United States, parents of children on the spectrum will throw all kinds of money at anything they think uh, will help their kid. And that opens the door for unethical uh, things, things that don't have enough research to support, but are a bright, shiny object. Um, how do you see moving the, the work that you've done in the long run towards uh, commercially available products that can have wider dissemination, but also be ethically informed? Mm -hmm. well, I mean, unfortunately, of course, most companies, they think about profit. That makes sense. And I feel like I love working in region research, doing studies, figuring out what works, what doesn't work and why. Uh, but I also see a problem not being able to distribute whatever I found out. So whatever I do, I do a study on a certain number of people and then it stays in the lab or on my computer or in the cloud and never gets out to anyone. So my dream is to have a platform of some extent where I can do the studies here and then we can maybe together with a company finish uh, finish it up, you know, I can, I can create something that is enough for a study, but there might be, we need a menu, we need the introduction for the guys, we need a manual, I, I hope we don't need a manual, but you know, you know what I mean, we need all this kind of stuff. The company and their co-workers can help finishing those kind of stuff, and then they can help distributing it, because we don't care about distribution, we just want it to get out, I just want it to get out there, so it can yeah. be used if it works. If it doesn't work, back to the drawing table and figure out what to do, which I love, it's super exciting to work with. Uh, I had another point on that. Uh, yeah, I love research, and I, but I also wanted to get get out there, whatever we find yeah. out. Yeah, well, that's the uh, we uh, we align on this. This is uh, my mission for the rest of my career is to help mm -hmm. things escape lab, uh, you know, and get into into the hands of mass numbers of people to have longer term mm -hmm. benefit. Uh, Anyway, um, I, I can pause now and let someone else take over and maybe jump back in later if there's other questions, but I don't want to take up all the time here. Um, I wish I could be there in person. Uh, yeah. I, well, I'm, really <laughs> I'm really bummed. I'm really bummed, but you know, maybe the opportunity will arise so once yeah. the uh, COVID dust settles. In the we future. would love to have you here after, after this. Uh, we had, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely, definitely. So I think we'll hand over the the word to uh, Marita, and then we can come back to Skift afterwards if there are follow-up questions. Yes, thank you. <laughs> well, I will also start to uh, congratulate you, and uh, I think you have demonstrated that you are really a fast mover, and it's very easy for you uh, to, you have a strong ability to change ideas into product very fast, and I think uh, that has really impressed me, and I hope that Maybe there could be some opportunity for us to collaborate in the future. Yeah, me too, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. But um, I was wondering, uh, the ASD, why... Um, now, I read the, the paper you wrote about the, the uh, opportunities for using VR in different psychiatric disorders. And now you have explained also other conditions or situations where we are, VR could be helpful. But... Uh, why did you pick specifically the uh, ASD? Do you think that is, um, are there anything that, uh, was it just a coincidence because you came to know some people or, or, or was it because that uh, you thought that for this group, uh, VR would be specifically uh, relevant? Yeah, uh, 
I mean, for, for both, a combination of both. I, I do voluntary work at Danish Youth Red Cross, a project called Plexus. It's for lonely young people. And we, we hang out, I'm there twice a month, and we cook and we uh, chat, we play board games, we socialize because they are lonely often because they have a diagnosis such as autism. And then we sit down and we talk. And this was before I started this PhD project. And these guys, they told me that and the stories they told me about stuff they had troubles with and the stuff I could hear they had, I could observe them not being able to do different things. And I, 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 I did by studying my thing, I knew about VR and I knew about some, to make some extent, its capabilities. But then I thought, okay, can we uh, mix those things up together and then create some simulations where they can, in a safe environment, train those, these kind of things? That simulation training and that's and simulating scenarios where they could do stuff they cannot do in real life. Most of them live at homes, uh, live at special homes. And they have, these days during COVID nineteen days they have so much, such a hard time. Some of them. I mean, I, I'm also a mentor for an autistic student at the university, and he's never leaving the home. His anxiety yeah. is up here. That pro, I mean, if he could, he could use some socialization via VR or something like that. And yeah, uh, so that 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 was the what triggered me. Uh, actually, I mean, me to like love this topic. So yeah, that was the main motivation for it, and also. And then I was, I'm wondering yeah. the, the, this with the seeing things real world instead of talking, and mm-hmm. also being able to move and uh, uh, sort of uh, get the uh, the skills into the movements. Also, do do you think that was important? Yes, because, you know, being, uh, training a skill by doing it, like Im- embodying the <laughs> yeah. whatever, I mean, <laughs> I need to pick up the item. The best way to learn is by picking up the item, putting it in my shopping basket. And then that's what I need to do. And in VR, we can do exactly that. Uh, and I see, uh, I see potentials in learning through doing by procedural knowledge creation, doing the procedures in the right order, so your brain has an easier time bringing information from long-term memory to working memory. Because you tried it in VR, it's in your long-term memory. So when you chunk, you have an easier time to chunk because you tried it while wearing this, and now you see it. Ah, I remember. Perhaps the process would be faster. Uh, and that's what I hope, and that's what I read, and that's uh, yeah. That was my note. So, yeah, I was then considering this you had with the touch and touchless. Mm-hmm. From this point of view that you are now explaining, you would actually ex- expect the touch list to be the most uh, usable where you learned most. Yeah, uh, the, uh, the, the touch list was the least usable uh, and it was most enjoyable, but there was the most least. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that's, uh, <laughs> that but you touch- would have expect to see the, the opposite, wouldn't you? Yes and no, because everybody got a touch screen nowadays. Uh, so I compared it with the interface that is super popular nowadays. Okay. At the touch screen, everyone has one in the pocket uh, or several around them. So maybe that was unfair. <laughs> okay. but, but also, the, I think also it was quite novel the way we did that study. I mean, you could shoot that study down in many ways. I mean, pressing a button mid-air like this mm. and the, like that, that's not picking up item. Maybe the next study should look into wearing this, picking up a virtual item, either with the hand and then I would love to compare it with this guy. So holding this controller, picking up the item, compared to ha- not, not having anything in your hand and picking okay. up the item. For the stuff like that, I think that would be the next study. Uh, but this, I mean, st- I, I, I hope I get to do a lot more of this kind of stuff in the future with and more participants, uh, both with the diagnosis, without diagnosis. Okay. Now, now, now I'm also, I feel like a free bird. <laughs> now the autism project is over. I'm looking forward to start doing studies on different mental disabilities or clinical VR than just yeah. autism. I think autism is still very close to my heart, but I, I would love to also at some point in my career get the time and opportunity to work with some other topics. Okay. Uh, yeah. I was just thinking that you had this paper where you uh, interviewed the teachers and they identified areas uh, and you chose many of them, but some of the social skills areas you you didn't. It was about uh, social anxiety and turn taking, but you didn't work with the rest of them. No, oh, time. <laughs> time. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you couldn't do everything, but but with no, the daily living skills, you did almost everything. Yeah, I read. 
<laughs> I, I started to work on the laundry. I started the Unity project for that, actually. Started doing the clothes uh, you could grab. Uh, and that was interesting. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, I feel like the procedural training makes, again, also maybe the social training thing is that now I, I'm more comfortable in creating multi-user interventions so I can put a, more people there to train social skills. Mm. Also school refusal. I was very interesting with working with school refusal. If you're too afraid to go to school, I was actually at a meeting with the, the high school uh, in the middle of Copenhagen uh, where they we were talking about doing something about school refusal for the children because their elementary schools, when they were going changing to high school, if they had autism, they would not show up. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But could we create intervention where they could experience from the safety of their home, experience the, the school before uh, going there? That, 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 that never, you know, finalized because it's in time, but that's something that can, I might have time to do now. I don't know if I get the time, but I hope I get the oh, time to work okay. on this kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. And how important do you think it is that it is interactive? You know, that it is, yeah, of course you understand. What it is. Very, yeah. Very, very important. Very I feel, I mean, not, I mean, except, except for if this exposure therapy or the school, you can just sit down, don't even need three degrees of freedom. You can just sit sit down and look at the environment. But I would even call that interactive because you get feedback based on your head rotation <laughs> on the three axes. So it's already interactive. But, but of course, you don't need to be able to grab stuff and do stuff in exposure therapy. If you're afraid of spiders, put VR on and see one. some, yeah, or see 360 movie of uh, crowded space, for instance. That is scary enough. That is immersive enough. But I, because for me that is also interactive. <laughs> because you move your head, you get feedback. Mm -hmm. But but if but that can work. I mean that that is enough uh, for exposure therapy. But if I want yeah. to train shopping or crossing the street, it might work as a video model, like similar to video modeling. You see the uh, correct behavior performed by somebody else in an immersive environment. So it might even be better than video modeling. Could be interesting to do a study on that. I would also love to do a study on uh, traffic safety using just the key, not immersive, using the keyboard and mouse compared to the immersive version where you actually walk around. Uh, so does it have to be in VR or will it have uh, some, to some extent, similar effect if we do it uh, just on a screen? Because again, not everybody has yeah. VR heads yet. At some point, as you mentioned in Logskip, it becomes like toasters in your papers. Everybody will have a head-mounted display in their kit, not the kitchen, in the, in the living room uh, on the shelf. Uh, but, but until then, everybody has a computer. So maybe we could compare those two. Sorry. Uh, again, I have another question regarding what is important. How important is it that the uh, animated figures are beautiful? And, and, yeah, look alike and uh, that they're very well made or is it okay uh, that they are stereotyped some of them totally uh i you you, you easily i mean as long as the, the realism is not that important that's something i believe and i also read and that is that it's not necessarily the high fidelity graphics is not required to feel like you are in a different environment and to do some task there and as you see none of my stuff is high fidelity nice graphics so I don't believe that is a requirement. And, and, and those are just, um, then, <laughs> then working with some of these schools, they are so nice that they buy the um, high, most high-end computers. For some of my studies, they have bought some of the most high-end computers at all the municipality with the best head-mounted displays. But the stuff I do would never require all of the resources on those computers because they will not be so beautiful as a... Uh, as some of these high-end games you see out there, because I don't believe it's necessary to have realistic, amazing graphics. Also, there is the whole issue with Uncanny Valley. Uh, <laughs> if I go towards realism, at some point it becomes uncanny because it looks very real, but then there is this zombie-looking thing inside. So yeah, also, yeah, maybe also because of my own skill level, I'm also not capable of creating realistic <laughs> graphics. Uh, so, okay. but, but I also don't believe that it's a requirement. You know, apparently uh, the, the pupils react adequate mm -hmm. also when it's not uh, very beautifully designed. Yeah. Okay. Um, what was it? Um, and then, then I had actually something when regarding the question that Skip asked previously about the, the concerns that people could have. And it's it is a concern I've had myself because we're setting up a trial with uh, social anxiety where we are comparing in view uh, exposure to virtual reality exposure. And the concern I have, uh, which I, I don't know 
about it yet. But the concern I have is whether we are just uh, disturbing uh, real um, effective therapeutic uh, uh, treatment that's actually taking place already and just introducing um, a lot of uh, demands on how to use uh, all this uh, equipment. More or less, I, I wouldn't say waste time, but but if we are not as efficient as the uh, as the uh, in vivo exposure, we, we in in that way we'll, we will need uh, to prove it. I, I heard about your study, and it's going to be one of the biggest one ever. I'm looking forward to that. But you know, the carrot in the end of your study, I feel it's so big that it's worth doing it. Because imagine if I mean, I, I also believe it's never going to get better than in vivo. But the cost, the time, what we were talking about with the skip about like resources it takes to do in vivo, in vivo exposure therapy, taking the play people to high high places, small rooms, whatever. I think if your study shows some positive results, then the the, the carrot in the how is it? I try to say something. The carrot is big, so we should do run after it. There must be something there, like could that. Be many, there could be many reasons. It's also possible to create situations that would be very difficult to find in real life. Yeah, totally, exactly. I don't know, I'm afraid oh, there are so many phobias. <laughs> yeah. And I'm looking forward to that study and I hope we can do something together as well, still with some of the interventions that I can create from my team. Yeah, and then, yeah, of course, you have more or less answered to it, but you have thought of moving into other disorders, not only ASD. Mm -hmm. Do you have any uh, specific considerations? Now you, you talked about language, but could there be other issues where you think that it would be relevant? Uh, I mean, yes. Uh, for me, uh, I, I, I mean, it's, I, I have some family members with PTSD uh, because of experiences in Iran. And those are definitely not the same as the Iraq war, but those are negative experience with the Iranian government. Uh, I mean, I don't want to get into that, uh, but uh, those, uh, like, this is very close to me personally. I know someone who is uh, a loved one of mine and she's, uh, she had some terrible experiences. And I wish, and she sees a psychiatrist and stuff like that, and I wish she could work with that in some of the stuff I'm working with and give this, that psychiatrist some tool to help her in experience those things again and uh, work with them and get rid of some of the negative uh, effects it ha had. So PTSD could be a thing, but not war-wise, but like in other other areas. Uh, other than that, uh, I mean, of course, uh, I, I had a ADHD was a thing because you, you, you put this on and then I control all the sensory information that comes in. So, so you might learn to focus. That's the dream I have. I haven't looked, to my knowledge, I haven't looked at studies trying to see if they can help these guys focus more. But if there are some potentials there, I would love to go there. Autism is close to my heart, the culture thing, but that's not a diagnosis. We have, I mean, the training, if you have broken a bone in your body, like training it up in a fun way, but there are so many studies on that already. Yeah. There is so much to take. You are working with schizophrenia, I remember. Uh, that's interesting. But that's, I mean, that's still very abstract for me, the whole idea of schizophrenia. I, I mean, I cannot wrap my mind around the whole problem they have. But the solutions I heard, read about is quite interesting. Uh, yeah. In VR, you can put people in any environment. To, uh, to, I mean, the powers are huge in the hands of clinicians. And I, there are so many opportunities there. And I hope we can give it to them as developers and at some point give them the power to develop them themselves or create them themselves at some point. Then I retire. Yeah. Do, do you think it is uh, that PTSD is uh, different uh, from anxiety? anxiety? In anxiety, you are uh, afraid of things that you imagine mm. that, that, that might actually never uh, really have been dangerous to you. But in PTSD, it is something that actually happened. Do you think that yeah. makes a difference? Well, I'm, I'm not a professional in that sense, but I feel it's I mean, something that you have up here that you experience that actually took place and that it's create these memories that keep coming, these images that keep coming back to you. And anxiety is more the fear of a negative consequence that might never have happened. 
uh, like uh, for instance, uh, performing in front of uh, the PhD committee and uh, being laughed at. <laughs> like, I mean, just the idea, right? So, and that's like a fear I have, but I have never performed in front of a PhD committee and being laughed at before. <laughs> so that's no, not no. Uh, logical uh, fear, but it's still there and I cannot help it. And it's a serious uh, problem. Uh, so there are similarities, but of course, the main difference is that the, the stuff that's been experienced by these people, uh, they, 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 they uh, solder themselves inside their retina. Uh, I, I mean, without being a profession, to my knowledge, I, 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 that's what, my understanding of PTSD and my yeah. personal knowledge of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, then I was thinking a little bit about the the strengths and opportunity you went through this uh, SWOT analysis that uh, Skip had written about uh, in one of his papers. And uh, you mentioned that gamification was very important, but I was thinking of which other strengths uh, do you think, strengths and opportunities would you? I loved uh, the term ecological validity. <laughs> yeah. It co confused uh, many people. I, I, I read it out loud, ecological validity. What do you mean? But the, the similarity between the training intervention and the place where the skills need to be performed. And for me, that's the main, uh, main power of, even bigger than gamification, it's the main power of virtual reality is the ability to create training simulation. But first of all, look like the same environment as the one where you have to perform the desired skill, but also require the same interaction, the same actions as the place where you have to perform the desired skills in. Mm -hmm. So that's for me the biggest one. Uh, gamification is, of course, awesome. The feel of sense of safety, especially mm -hmm. if you have these kind of issues, that's a huge one as well. And there's a person, uh, I mean, what else did he have? He had uh, the, this thing with the training from home. I, I take that and I ran with it. Let's create stuff where the kids can train at home from the safety of their home instead of having to go. Or even if I had uh, if I had a broken leg, I wish I could stay at home and re practice stuff without having to get myself in some vehicle or something and get to the therapist uh, of uh, what do you call physiotherapist office to do that. That would be great. Uh, training yeah. data. That would be amazing. And that training data could even be used to map out in the future like the performance of each child and maybe use it to assess uh, their diagnosis even more and stuff. We can use the technology to assess even more efficiently. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I think that was uh, the last question I had. I don't know if uh, Skip has something to add or... No. Oh. Okay. Then uh, George's. I don't yeah. know if you have a follow-up question. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, Alif, I know you are tired, so <laughs> I would like to be uh, fast with uh, some questions and comments that I would like to make. So, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation, which was very clear, easy to follow and understand exactly as also your report is. And uh, as uh, also Skip and Marete mentioned, it was really impressive the amount of the work that you have done and have produced in only three years. Uh, and as well also the scientific papers that you have produced. It's really amazing that you have published uh, this uh, big amount of uh, scientific papers. And also regarding your, your uh, approach, these uh, three research questions that you have placed are really strong and really nice and somehow cover a big variety of the topics of your work and summarize and, orga and organize your work very efficiently. So I will start with some uh, general questions. So first of all, uh, since adults and children with autism have challenges in, in, a, in a lot of, in a big variety of skills like behavior, social, emotional, living skills, uh, also phobias, communication skills, and also as well, uh, sensory hmm. skills, attention issues. So there is a big range of problems. And you try to deal with a lot of different uh, problems with uh, your different solutions and uh, projects that you have worked with. So do you think that there is something more specific that maybe VR can be more successful or more helpful compared to others? So there were some kind of failures or there were some kind of more successful examples or uh, applications of VR? 
uh, for some, maybe something I haven't looked at, for instance, uh, already, uh, what could be, uh, um, I mean, I, as you, you mentioned so much, and, and I haven't looked at everything. I, for instance, the sensory, the modality I mean, issues. I mean, on the, on the projects that you have with. Oh, the one I have worked with. On. So what do you think that maybe was more successful compared to others? So it was the, the money, you mentioned about the money. Yeah, no, okay, now, no, sorry. Uh, yes, so that I, I felt also maybe because of my low sample data and stuff like that, but I felt like this everyday living skills, I felt VR could give a lot to them because you could train by doing and you had to do stuff compared to other methods. Uh, the social anxiety, I've been know it works, uh, VR works. Uh, but for me, it was super interesting that the everyday living skills, such as in the future laundry or the kitchen I'm working on, where you have to actually do, perform the tasks, they have huge potential. You can pick up a plate, place it in the cabinet, but there are other plates, not in the cabinet, but there are glass cups. Uh, you can do it. You can open, you can close, you can put it in there. Uh, you can... Uh, I mean, grab the fork and play with it and place it in a specific place. Uh, that's uh, and in a fun way. I, I, I see lots of potential on daily living skills because the social skills, uh, social, I mean, social skills, social anxiety already works. Social skills is such a hard topic to work with because I'm not a professional. I, I know how to clean a kitchen across the street. I can create a training simulation. Social skills uh, are very sensitive, yeah. except for traffic safety. Uh, but also, yeah, there was the eye contacting. I was always dreaming about doing a project where you practice, first of all, reading uh, facial expressions, but also keeping eye contact. In VR, we have this eye tracker. Uh, we are actually, we just got a VR headset in the lab with eye tracker in them. I hope I get to play with them, but you can practice keeping eye contact, reading facial expressions. That's social skill that I haven't looked at. I think might be uh, super nice to do some studies on that. Uh, I heard about a project where there was this, uh, in VR for autistic kids, there was this dragon reading out a nice story when you put the goggles on, but if you didn't look in the dragon in the eye, he would stop reading. So you always had to look at him and he would continue reading. So, but there are potentials uh, doing that. Yeah. Nice, yeah. that's a follow-up question on this matter, on this topic. Um, the, the, the focus is on how to deal with problems. Right, so behavior uh, problems, social living skills problems. What about and do you think that VR can be, can be also useful to support to advance some skills that mm. people with ASD may have? Because it's not only that people with ASD have problems, but also they may have some unique skills. So, do you think that can be also used from a positive? Um, how can I say that from a positive perspective in order to advance even more these skills and support the some unique skills that they make? I feel like, for instance, in the money training, one of the guys, I observed him loving placing all the coins in a extremely even order yeah. next to each other and then the next place. And he relaxed so much by doing that. He wasn't doing the task that he was supposed to do. He was just placing these coins in the order. And it was therapeutic for him. He relaxed. I feel like there are some potentials there to create something that they can trigger these kind of skills and desires they have to make it. Also, of course, under you know, in the old days, we used to, people used to call it Asperger's syndrome, but the, the, today is the high functioning autism. That's uh, they have so many uh, unique skills, specific things that they are super good at. Uh, at, at puzzle games, uh, putting puzzles together. Uh, doing, uh, I don't know, machine learning, but that cannot be in VR. Uh, programming, uh, even, uh, you know, <laughs> writing all the numbers in VR. <laughs> uh, there are some crazy skills there uh, that I, I could try to you know, investigate which one of them could be done in VR that are not easy to do in real life and then give them the opportunity to do it. And I don't right now have something right in top of my brain. That could be relevant. It's like a sort of those not superpower, but something they really love doing and they're really good at it. But and it's not easy to do. Like doing in, vi in vivo exposure therapy is not always easy to take somebody on a high building to practice not being afraid of height. In the same manner, it might not be easy always to if you love to count 
windows on the tall buildings and you are very fast at it. That's a bad example. <laughs> Something you call that, we can put that in VR because VR is such a fluid thing. You can shape it as you want and create the intervention you want to support them in something they're good at to do that, to have a more enjoyable life and uh, like relax and enjoy enjoy experience uh, and then get back to this real life with, us, with all these people with the facial expressions they have a hard time yeah. dealing with. Okay, nice. On another issue, uh, you, are mention, you mentioned also in your report, I think in, it was in page 25, uh, about this, uh, this uh, uh, individualized treatment that VR can offer. And this is, I think, really important because of, obviously there are a lot of differences in people, uh, cultural, psychological, physical, whatever. There are also different levels of ASD. So have you considered your VR, your specific VR implementations to which, uh, to which specific range of the spectrum or to which uh, range of people, user group, is maybe more applicable? Is it... You, so your target group was everybody with ASD. So you had some kind, have you considered uh, this kind of approach? So what was the uh, personalization uh, level of your, uh, of your projects? But I, I talked what the teachers gave me, <laughs> basically. Uh, I mean, the teacher said, you can do a study on these guys. They have time. You're allowed to use them. And you're not allowed to learn exactly about their diagnosis and um, but they have autism that's all i was told sometimes i was told uh, approximately about their iq level but that's it but i feel like uh, low functioning ones can uh, benefit a lot from these kind of interventions mm -hmm. the more simple tasks such as the money training so simple the task and also re require with the, those have like learning disabilities some uh, disadvantages with the iq level those on the higher functioning they could take advantage of the social skills training So the shopping, being in crowded places, performing, giving presentation in front of other people. Uh, like this, I, I feel like as social skills, I would like to focus more on the high functioning ones and the daily living skills, the simpler tasks that are necessary for independent adulthood, not using money. But supermarket, the other guys might also need that, right? So it's, I mean, I need to... <laughs> yeah. The spectrum is so wide, as I mentioned. Uh, that's why I have a wide angle camera here today, so I could do this. It's such a wide uh, array of uh, people. But, yeah. yeah, and in the same context, I have this another question or maybe comment about, because it's not only about uh, personalization, it's also about this early, as, uh, as soon as possible intervention. So Uh, the, the earliest you do these such interventions, uh, the, the best the results. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, uh, have you tried again to somehow uh, include some kind of guidelines? Because your projects are really nice in order also, I can see them also as guidelines on how to apply this. Uh, mm -hmm. So, what do you have any guidelines about when do you think that these sets of interventions are maybe better to be applied? So is it uh, for toddlers, for very young children? Is it also applicable for uh, adults even? I don't know. So what do you think about the age group? I never went lower than nine uh, because I don't know and I haven't, to my knowledge, found any studies about the consequences of using prolonged usage of VR. But also in all of my experiments have been maximum 10 minutes to 15 because of the school's ethical rules. So they were not allowed to use more 10 meals. So we didn't do that. So minimum nine years, but th there are some studies showing that comparing skill training after, I don't remember exactly 20 something and before 20 something. And then it was a long-term study, I remember, where they measured their independent adulthood afterwards. And they could see those who received the training earlier. They were, I mean, <laughs> of course, more independent compared to the group that received the training later. So I've, the teenager, the 10, 11, up till 20, 21, I, I don't right now remember exactly the age, but I feel like that's the place, that's when we have to uh, train and help and uh, help this target group at the latest. 
and maybe we can go even younger than nine at some yeah. point. Uh, I'm not going to do it uh, right now. But at some point when there are studies showing that um, this thing works, uh, then uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, another question that I have is about the the colors and the, actually the scenes that you have built in these mm -hmm. VR environments. Because uh, also I remember like 10 years ago that uh, I also did a, a small uh, research on this topic and it was nice that I, I got a, a citation uh, from you uh, about from this work. Uh, I remember that there was a lot of discussion about the specific color palette. Since uh, the majority of kids or children with ASD uh, perceive colors more intensely in comparison mm. to children to, with normal development. So uh, more pale colors or white and gray other tones are more calming to these kids. And um, I, was, I remember that uh, something like the, the background that I have this uh, pale pink is mm -hmm. considered as the more calming mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, for children with ASD. So have you, uh, have you, take, have you considered this approach of uh, the color palette and uh, uh, the, the scene that you have, that, uh, you have built in your uh, interventions? I tried to make it uh, motivated and cartoonish, but uh, I wish I had <laughs> tried to make the colors more calm, as you uh, found out, as and as as I mentioned. But I didn't do that. But in the, because some of my colors are very like in your eye, uh, like very strong colors, uh, and I, I I wish I had done that. But in the future, the future interventions, I feel like I I will do. I will go more the four calm color plates. In this kind of interventions. Yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, and on a, on the similar topic about uh, uh, the the scenes and uh, the specific uh, id, uh, interventions, uh, you have put a lot of uh, focus on this uh, six degree six degrees of freedom VR, mm -hmm. um, which obviously enhances the interfaces and. Uh, if, and is better and uh, more natural. So uh, do you think that the investment or the, the more effort spent in order to create this six degrees of freedom is worth? So is it something that uh, you think that all the future interventions should follow this six degrees of freedom? Or maybe we can also build some interventions that are more simple, and without this kind of uh, full interaction that uh, six degrees of freedom can offer. I mean, of course we can do some stuff with three degrees of freedom. The problem is I feel like as soon as I start doing this and, and nothing, I mean, I don't get the feedback I want, then you, uh, you lose some of that. Yeah. 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 I so I, I, And the technology is developing. I mean, this will cost a couple yeah. of thousand very soon. Uh, and the better versions of it is coming out and uh, we will soon, uh, some people will have one of these instead of a toaster soon. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I feel like we should go six degrees of freedom <laughs> just in case, even though we are not using it, but it's there in case the user does uh, one of these movements. But uh, the, some uh, lots of interventions, for instance, the 360 videos, I mean, of course they will not be able to be tracked <laughs> because the camera has been one stationary location. So for 360 videos, we yeah. can use three, three, three degrees of freedom. Yeah. Uh, but then otherwise, uh, I haven't also done that much with 360 videos uh, because I'm a huge fan of uh, interactive uh, environments in Unity <laughs> instead of filming stuff. But of course, there are potential in uh, 360 video a lot. Uh, that is three degrees of freedom. And stuff with like that only work with those things. So, yeah. Okay. And uh, you have made a very nice and very detailed presentation of all the methods for interventions for based on displays or VR or traditional. So, based on this, uh, since you, it seems that you have a very detailed and uh, a very nice overview of all these interventions that uh, from the literature. Can you see some kind of a trend or any special focus? So what it seems that maybe works better uh, based on the literature. So what is your opinion about it? So with the traditional methods? In uh, general, I would say, uh, maybe I would say focus more on the 
technological method, so display-based or VR-based, mm -hmm. because this was also what you have done uh, mm -hmm. in, your, uh, uh, in your review. Uh, yeah, there, there are lots of that you have yeah, yeah, the table. Yeah, there are yeah. lots of papers looking at screen-based interventions, and lots of them have very nice results. <laughs> mm. That's the thing. Uh, it seems like they work if you just do it on screen. That's why I mentioned earlier. I would love to try to do some studies where I create the same scene, same applications in Unity, and then I try to compare screen base with uh, immersive uh, VR base. See, yeah. is it necessary to go in VR? Or can we just uh, train, um, I don't know, the traffic or the shopping or whatever using mouse and keyboard in front of a screen? Uh, of course, the cave one uh, requires a cave. Uh, but the, I mean, the screen base, everybody got a screen. Everybody got a keyboard and mouse most often. Would they uh, be sufficient? Uh, because there are so many studies, as you mentioned, that have used them. But they have used them because we were in a time where the availability of head-mounted displays were not uh, there. Not yet. Not yet at that point. So yeah. Also, my, one of my next projects is going to be to do a review article <laughs> where I go in depth. Well, uh, I like, think this is very important and very nice topic because it's always the question, you know, exactly as the, it was the 3D television and now the, the 2D television. <laughs> and, and ah. The 3D television was out, everyone was talking, okay, 3D television is great and everybody will have 3D television. And finally, nobody actually has 3D television and we all prefer 2D television. Uh, and this reminds me of this uh, Gartner hype of cycle that, you know, that now VR is going to the plateau of productivity where we find the actual meaningful applications of VR. And I think what you have done is, is really contributing to some kind of meaningful contributions of VR with all these uh, nice projects that you have done. In guys, guys in the 90s started doing that. I mean, <laughs> even before all this, now I said there are lots of uh, people like uh, Skip and uh, other people from America, they started in the 90s looking at, yeah, uh, yeah what's the word for it? Terrible uh, VR uh, equipments. Uh, <laughs> to do uh, exposure therapy with graphics that was terrible and like the 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 what is it called the sword of uh, the ultimate display uh, in the yeah, 60s absolutely. with the wireframe and this was a very good choice on to work on with vr because it is proved now that vr makes some sense and mm -hmm. after 20 years i don't know how many years more than 20 years actually yeah. uh, vr seems that uh, is something that can be used for teaching uh, children or adults uh, with uh, yeah. ASD. So um, I feel like uh, the, the question of why we should use VR has been answered long time ago because exactly. it makes so much sense. You can place people in this uh, box yeah. where you control everything. Yeah. But uh, Since we're talking about uh, the use of the VR and we know also that children with ASD really like to use technologies and are really fascinated with technology, so this is another reason to to uh, introduce VR. How uh, because there are also a lot of uh, I was taking also a lot of not research but maybe approach of how to use also robots or social robots mm -hmm. for to support people with uh, ASD. How do you see this is like a competition, or can <laughs> you think that this can be? somehow uh, complement each other or work together, robots and VR? Have you thought about it or? I haven't thought about that. I'm doing it now. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, I, I don't want to be in here forever. I mean, I, mean I, I personally, I get tired of wearing HMP more than 45 minutes the most. So I take it off. And if I have some issues, I have some, I mean, I, could be nice to have some other means of assistant like a robot uh, for whatever social skills training, a, a robot with a face that talks to me, teaches me. Uh, now it, it, this means smile. And then you got these extreme expressions on a screen uh, with some, uh, <laughs> or if we can, we have this Google and other people are coming up with this uh, voice recognition stuff. So if you could train having conversation with the robot outside of VR, it doesn't have to be in VR. It's, it's a robot, it's not a human being. I assume, to, I assume that they will not feel as, uh, stressed having to analyze a robot and they would having to analyze a real person. So I see lots of potentials there that I, of course, haven't thought about before now. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. And the robots have lots of potentials. I mean, just after, as, as, a, as a sport, because I'm still on team VR. <laughs> and <laughs> once you take these guys off, yeah, why not?
Okay. Yeah, thank you, Ali, for the answers and yeah, discussion. Uh, I don't have any other questions, so maybe Hans, Hans Jorgen. Yes, um, I'm actually in a, in a situation where we have one from the audience that has been chatted outside from the people who are. But I think I will read the question in a way, and then I think it's fair enough. Um, the question sounds like Do you think using existing social video game? platforms such as via chat or checkbox could have educational benefits for people with various conditions question mark yeah i i, I uh, <laughs> due to corona and my isolation here i've been socializing using uh, using a vr chat and some of these other applications with some friends and it's amazing i mean the environments are there you can uh, go to uh, different places in VR, different uh, visual environments, and you can, if the teacher is in, looked into the same environment, I mean, you don't have to create everything, just <laughs> some of these, uh, yeah, what do you call it, uh, p p p p p stuff that is out there, like games. You can use them for, uh, as a teacher, to take the child into a VR chat room where you are on, on Mars or you are somewhere else, and then they, you can you control the avatar each, exactly as the thing I try to do. And then you can, because they, the game company already did it, and then they can uh, use it to, to learn about those kind of stuff. And uh, there are, uh, Google has done some learning interventions for the three degrees of freedom VR, where they can take the children into, into Egypt to watch the pyramids. And then the teacher using the iPad, he can uh, uh, direct the gaze of the children by pressing arrow. Okay, if you, everybody, everybody looks right, then everybody, and then there's an arrow appearing until, or something like that. Until they look right, they see the pyramids, and then the teacher can talk to them about that pyramid. So there are consumer applications, there are games, consumer games there that can be used. Job Simulator is a super nice application to train motor skills, uh, simple motor skills and some other simple logic skills and stuff like that. So I see lots of potential with those things. Not everything has to be done from bottom up, but... Uh, <laughs> No, good. Good. I have one more that has come in or has been, yeah. How do you ensure users are protected from various visual leashes that might result in uncomfortable or trauma sensing traumatic visuals? Similar, how can people such as teachers using VR software protect students from malicious actors such as cyber bullies or ah. hackers? Oh shit! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, um, don't know if you're able to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> That's. Uh, I wish I could. I think I I, I heard about a project actually. Uh, some people at MIT. Some. Uh, people I know, a friend uh, who is working on a project that did analyze chat room data and try to make a artificial intelligence that automatically kick and ban people who are abusive and uh, trolling and stuff like that. But how we can, I mean, how the teachers can assist them, I don't, I don't know. I, 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 I don't feel that's, <laughs> that has not been my focus at all. I haven't, hmm. I haven't allowed other people into my intervention <laughs> except those who had the application. But I haven't thought about it. That's a good question. If uh, we can come up with a solution with that for that, then I'm sure uh, lots of companies would be so happy, such as VR chat. I experienced yeah. some uncomfortable things on VR chat as well <laughs> during mm -hmm. Corona times. So yeah. yeah. <clears throat> good. I think that was uh, the questions for your defense. I think Skip, Brady, you don't have anything to follow up? No. Just fine. So um, I think the committee has to withdraw uh, now and make the, um, the final statement about the, the defense. Um, normally, we would go for the reception now, <laughs> the audience. <laughs> but I think we have to stay in our living rooms and then wait for your, uh, for your decision. That There's another room you go into, isn't there? Where's a room yes. where... You, yeah. should, we, should we say a specific time in, so that you don't need yeah. to Yeah, Yeah, I was about, that's very good you suggest that because I was about to suggest, but I think it was a little bit out of my order to do, but how long time do you, have you thought of? I would say uh, 20 minutes is enough. 20 minutes? Okay, so we will meet here in 20 minutes to 8 Danish time.
Yes. Is that okay? Perfect. Yes. And okay. everybody else, okay, we can stay here and uh, keep company yeah. to Ali. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah, me, everybody can be unmuted now and also show the camera. Yeah. Yeah. So, so here, this is the reception. The 20 minutes time. <laughs> <to> this, <laughs> so we'll come back in uh, 25 minutes, 23 minutes. 20, yes. yeah, no, no, 20 no minutes. rush, no rush. We will have our party. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so bye. see you now, guy. Bye bye. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Oh my god, Amy. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see. Let me see it here. Hi, Camilla. Hi. I can't stop Hi. the video. Yeah, I want something to drink. If I mean, I hope I want something to drink. Let's see what they say. <laughs> oh, Too early for me. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. That's right. Oh, man. I'll, I'll, I'll lift one up at around 9 o'clock tonight, California time, and celebrate. Yes, please. Yes. John, is that you again? No, it's not me. <laughs> it's definitely somebody. <laughs> Evening, Taylor. <laughs> Casey, got Clara, Ailey? Got Clara. Oh, what's that? It's me, Ellie. No! <laughs> yes, fine. Yeah. So, Georgios, now, now I think you can hear me, right? Yeah. 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 So, um, before I announce the final decision of the committee, uh, I would like to say a lot of congratulations to Ali not only for being such a great guy and a nice colleague, but also for this excellent work that he has done for his uh, PhD. So now I'm going to read uh, just the conclusion uh, for the oral presentation and discussion and the final conclusions. So the candidate presented the thesis clearly, well organized and focusing on answering the relevant research questions. During the questions session, he showed maturity and ability to answer to a wide range of topics, from technological aspects to methodological, methodological issues, as well as some practical implications of the conducted research. The committee found the defense to be of high quality. Conclusions. Collectively, the thesis clearly represents an important body of research work in a challenging field of how virtual reality can be used to teach social and daily living skills to children and adolescents diagnosed with ASD. The present work has contributed to advance the state of the art in the field by introducing an extensive set of different solutions and prototypes. The research is well conducted, showing that Mr. Adjurlu has achieved a maturity as researcher. The committee unanimously recommends that Ali Adjurlu is awarded the PhD degree. So congratulations. Oh. Oh, hey. oh. <laughs> and uh, and also I would like to give the word now to Mirete and Steve so that uh, they can also congratulate you. Maybe Mirete, you can start. If you can unmute yourself. No, should I unmute? Where is Mirete? Can somebody unmute Mareda? Hi, Matt. No. Where is Mareda? Where is Mareda? She is. She is not here right now. Ah. Okay. She's not here. Okay. So maybe we can start with Skip and Mareda if she can join. Maybe she's trying to take her own. I don't know. Oh. She's not. Ali, the moment that you said that everything was nice with the uh, <laughs> online, then we had the first I jinxed problem. It. I jinxed it. Uh. Okay, uh, should I just go on then? Yeah, yeah. please keep. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, um, very impressive work. Um, certainly uh, a diverse, uh, yet still focused area 
of effort, uh, done in a short period of time. Uh, I just hope and pray that you uh, continue on this path and evolve this work because you planted so many positive seeds that I think um, illustrate uh, the potential for the future here to make a difference uh, for, for not just uh, folks on the spectrum, but a um, wide range of um, other clinical populations that I think can benefit from this sort of work. I mean, you know, we focus on autism, but let's face it, uh, people with developmental disabilities, learning disabilities, you know, wide range of clinical groups can benefit from uh, the, the, the seedling efforts that you've put together here. Uh, and I think some of them are very close to, to being something that could be used uh, on a wider scale, a little bit more research and a little more um, iterations, of course. You know, we, we're never happy with uh, the first pass. Um, but, you know, I found it really impressive and uh, I was actually a bit jealous. Uh, I wish I had uh, one of you in our lab right now uh, banging stuff out uh, because sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes people take a slow course on these things and uh, they don't realize that the world is moving fast and you got to run hard to keep up. And I think you have, and I'm, I'm impressed and you have my respect. And uh, I hope we do get to meet in person. And I would also love to get a copy of your slide deck um, with the videos, if that's possible, because I do a fair number of talks where I highlight not just my own work, but the work of others. Mm -hmm. Uh, to do a summary of the field, and I'd be proud to incorporate some of your uh, <laughs> efforts into um, my future talks and spread the word and so forth. So, congrats. It's a little early in the morning. It's uh, <laughs> quarter to 11, but I did bring a, a glass. I'll, I'll, si I'll take one for the team when we Thanks. do a toast and uh, carry Thank on. You. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers. Uh, congratulations, Ali. Cheers. Mm. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm I'm so touched. This is I wish you are here. I mean, in real life, it's so weird uh, but it's so nice in the same time. Because that's a big problem of mine. But I cannot probably come. Uh, that's no problem. Um, as soon as you open the borders for the Europeans, I would love to actually to have a stay abroad somehow there. And also, yeah. Mahay is not here. But yeah. Well, we might we might not let you go back. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. Might want to keep you here. <laughs> yeah. That could be. I heard the weather is good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi, Tor. Tor is the teacher I was talking about. Uh, he's the guy who gave me all of those valuable feedback. And you shaved your head again. <laughs> yes, I did. Uh, it's my new Corona cut. <laughs> Congratulations, Ailey. So proud of <laughs> you. you. Thank you for all you have done and the other teachers and your colleagues, especially you though, that uh, helping me with everything. Anytime, my friend, anytime. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, trying to grow a beard like yours in Corona time. <laughs> <laughs> Just let it go, see what happens. So Mereta is also online. So maybe Mereta, you can also say a few words. Yeah. I just want to say uh, congratulations. <laughs> really meant what I said, that you were uh, maybe not a first mover, but really a fast mover. And I think uh, I was very impressed with your work. And uh, I could also say on behalf of the country that uh, I was so happy they let you out of Sandholm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm mm -hmm. too. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, uh... And I wish you all the best, and I, I hope that we'll be able to collaborate sometimes. And yeah. I think you have a lot of ideas, and things uh, very easily change from ideas into something that could be tried out. I think that's great. Yeah, I mean, I think a cooperation would make so much sense. You guys are great at doing great studies, and we can create the interventions together with you and other stakeholders, and then do some nice big studies and the interventions we design yeah. for you uh, and the long term. So I would love that. So is it official, official? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's it's such an anti-climax. Can I take a selfie? I mean, can, I, can we take a picture with the committee? <laughs> How does this work? Right now, I'm here with uh, Camilla and uh, Stefania. <laughs> I have a band drinking here. <laughs> you should take a picture of the screen with all the people present. Yeah. yeah. It's hard with all. 
You can get 25 of this. Uh, well, I'm saying that, but, but people are doing screen recordings of this. So. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> but congratulations, Ali. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Hatsian. Yeah. Let's go. Cool. 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 Congratulations. Cool. Thank you. Cool. 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 Cool.